we and if we start recording not okay welcome everybody thanks so much for joining us this morning and this is um our great pleasure this is another qatar uh, seminar we are a research project funded by the national center of poland and uh so and we are very happy to host uh, Lu uh, lucia uh, Pozzi, who's uh who's joining us from uh from, as I said, from Australia. <laughs> and uh, Lucia is a member of the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities at the University of, of Queensland. And she, her work is on, um, she's a historian working on, on, on Catholicism and sexuality and reproduction. And her recent book, about which I hope we hear more in a few moments, um, was published just last year by uh, Palgrave Macmillan, uh, Macmillan, and the title is Catholicism and uh, Sexual Knowledge in the 19th and 20th Centuries. So, and, uh, and the topic of today's talk is from Ananism to Humane Vitae, a, a Catholic Journey into Modern Sexuality. So, Lucia, thanks so much for joining us, and the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for joining me uh, for this um, conversation. I hope to be uh, clear and uh, if I skip something, um, we can talk about it later. Um, it's, um, it's really great pleasure. I've never talked about um, um, this research in those terms. Uh, it's the first time I, I, I spoke to, to many conferences, but um, today I, I, I just want to have a different focus. Um, so I'm going to start from uh, the very beginning. Uh, I'm going to uh, focus on a few core components of my, um, uh, of my argument in my book. And uh, um, I will start to say that I probably don't need to emphasize um, the importance of historical roots of Catholic attitudes uh, um, towards reproductive rights, towards sexuality. Uh, this is something that uh, everyone in these uh, meeting knows. Um, what I would say is that many of these roots rest on unchallenged assumptions. So I'm going to talk about a couple of things uh, in this regard. Um, and for the sake of this presentation, I'll go over a few points. Um, actually, going um, from Umane Vitae backwards. So um, the idea of this book, my research started when I did my PhD. Uh, it was about um, the history of the encyclical Casti con Nubi. Um, Many of you probably uh, know what this meant, uh, what, what this document meant, uh, um, because I expect that there are many students and, and scholars of Catholicism. Uh, but for those of you who don't know anything about it, uh, Castico Nubi was published in 1930. It was the first Catholic pronouncement on birth control, abortion, and eugenics. Um, the encyclical was very important because it defined the doctrine uh, from then on, which meant uh, that Pius XI uh, took the topic away from theological debates. Um, and these affected uh, in a very substantial way uh, the development of the doctrine um, after that. And uh, the most important thing is that uh, the discussion about family planning at the Second Vatican Council failed for that reason. And Paul VI issued Humane Vitae, um, preventing the topic to be further debated in a collegial way, because he believed that he had to reinforce um, the contents the ban on birth control um, that was uh, stated by Castigo Nubi. So this, this was the main important uh, consequence of um, um, the issue of, of this encyclical. 
um, then cyclical, as I was able to discover, had other effects uh, on uh, contemporary um, politics. Uh, uh, it was a document that um, foster corroborated natalist uh, policies in many countries, including Italy, France, Spain in the 30s. Um, and uh, it's probably redundant to say, but the ban on birth control in 1930 um, was um, very harsh for people um, hit by the severity of the Great Depression. Uh, and uh, these ban coerced people uh, to abstain or to accept unwanted pregnancies. And, it, and we have to say that um, in the 1930, uh, it wasn't as in the 1960 when, when Umane Vita was published. So nobody or very few dared to defy um, the doctrine. Okay, so this is um, the context. What I want to emphasize uh, in this presentation is that um, what happened uh, with Castigo Nobi? Castigo Nobi was um, the, first, uh, the first time a pope made the Catholic discourse on sexuality public. It was the first time ever. No other pope um, stated the doctrine on sexuality so um, clearly and, and publicly. Uh, uh, there were precedent documents on, on uh, um, marriage, uh, for example, Ar um, Arcanum Divine Sapientiae, uh, other documents that stated the doctrine on, on other points, um, on conjugality, but not on sexuality. So this is the, the first thing I, I, just, I just want to emphasize. Um, so what how happened that these topics that were usually limited to the space of the confessional became public discourse? This was my um, main research question. So this was the, the, the driving force of my book. So as I was able to discover, um, numerous clues pointed to the importance of the 19th century. Um, for example, uh, a great number of files um, of the Holy Office uh, shows an unprecedented interest in uh, reproductive issues. That was something uh, quite important, uh, especially the second half of the 19th century. Uh, so an increase or in, uh, in, uh, in decrease about sexuality. Um, before then, the Holy Office had never engaged with these kind of topics and not in, in, in so much in two details and not so much in, in technical terms, uh, discussing, for example, um, medical procedures. That was something very new. Um, so I just want to give you um, like some dates. For example, the first decree ever published by the Holy Office on abortion was issued in 1882. Um, so before then, it was the duty of the confessor to deal with sexual sins. And, and sexuality was a matter of private um, dialogue between believers and their sp spiritual carers. So this is how my investigation started. And, um, yeah, and yes, I have to say that the Catholic Church has always regulated sexual behaviors. But I see in these events something that's um, essentially modern, it's different. So this is probably the, the, my, my core argument. And uh, I'm gonna show you some examples um, um, <clears throat> to illustrate my points. Okay, um, so the first example I'm gonna use is um, the history of the term onanism. So if we look at 
the presence of this term, um, we are probably uh, um, prone to think that onanism is, is the religious term and it has always been uh, present in Catholic theology. But um, what I was able to, to, to establish is that uh, first, onanism is um, a relatively, relatively recent term and its meaning is not stable over time. So, for example, if we look at these uh, definition that you can see uh, in, in my, um, on my slides, um, we have this, this definition. Onanism consists in the following. Man, after having undertaken coitus, withdraws before emitting seed and he disperses it in order to avoid conception. It's evident to anyone that this means wallowing in pleasure and at the same time refusing to take conjugal responsibilities. Um, I have to say that I'm not the only historian uh, who has looked into it. Um, and there is um, a more eminent uh, historian who has done that, uh, who is um, Thomas Lacour, who is an American um, uh, historian of sexuality, um, who has traced back uh, the history of, of this um, term. He equated um, onanism with masturbation, which is something I, I take issue uh, with. But um, the main thing I disagree on uh, with uh, Thomas Lacour is the fact that this is not a totally secularized history. So onanism is a term that stems from a, a sort of medical uh, popular writing but has um, an importance in Catholic moral writing as well. And it reverberates back into medical writing, but I'm going to show you how this happened. So, oh, I'm sorry, this happens all the time. Okay. Um, The word onanism didn't exist before the 18th century. So this is something that uh, we have to bear in mind um, and didn't emerge from, from religious sources. Of course, onan is a biblical figure and I'm happy to, to um, uh, recount his story uh, later. Um, according to what I've found, um, onanism in Catholic moral literature uh, made its appearance at the beginning of the 19th century. And this occurred after the publication and reception of two major works on the topic. Uh, one is Onenia, a medical popular treatise uh, by an anonymous uh, English author. And the other one is uh, um, L'onanism, dissertation sur les maladies produites par la masturbation um, by um, Tissot, who has uh, a series of uh, names I don't remember, <laughs> a very long name, Tissot. Um, so what is important about this um, medical moral literature is that um, onanism is a, is a moral, crime is, is a sin also for these doctors and um, is a sin with pathological consequences. So it's a sin that has physical symptoms, okay? So this includes uh, slug, slug, sluggishness, loss of appetite, affections uh, of respiratory system, uh, slackening of the nervous system and so on. And there are many more. And um, these um, moral literature uh, established, uh, let's say, um, a new moral discourse on, on sexuality, a discourse that was uh, uh, secular. 
But um, what I found is that these literature, especially uh, the book by Tissot, found attentive readers among theologians as well. Um, Catholic manuals um, indicate a process of perception of, of this medical popular thought. And uh, what happens is that um, med, um, um, Catholic moral literature incorporated the idea that these scenes caused physical symptoms, okay? So a very important author I just want to mention here uh, quickly is uh, Pierre de Bren. Uh, de Bren was a physician. He converted to Catholicism um, after a, uh, a miraculous recovery from serious illness. He was um, uh, a guest uh, at a um, monastery um, in France. Um, he took his vows as a priest um, and uh, because he was unable to practice his medical profession, he started to write uh, moral treatises where he um, introduced confessors uh, into medical um, knowledge medical uh, findings of, of that age, especially 19th century biology, um, things that he deemed to be really, really important. Um, in fact, he wrote that it was time to transform the teaching of moral theology into something, something new, a new way, a way of enlightenment and progress. Um, he wanted to offer his new expertise on the body um, to confessors. And, um, and, and the reason uh, was that uh, he thought that confessors needed to understand the physical root of mental disturbances, impediments to freedom, derangements of the will, and troubles of passion. I was quoting, sorry. Um, the idea behind all of that was a very materialist, materialist one, was that um, these, um, um, these problems in the mind and spirit had a physical source. So he, he was able to bridge um, um, this new form of medical morality and Catholic sexual ethics. Um, I just want to give you an example of what uh, he uh, believed about um, onanism. He said that onanists became hysteric and experienced the worst pains, headaches, chest pain, stomachache, rheumatism, drowsiness, and the, the list of symptoms um, goes on and on. Um, among the brand's sources, uh, there were various medical authors, including um, Friedrich Hoffmann, uh, who was uh, uh, a very important doctor um, uh, in the 18th century, Cornelius Klockhoff, uh, Gottlieb Ludwig, uh, and Jacques-Louis uh, Dussaint de Breil. Uh, who is a member of the French Academy of, Sci of Sciences. And um, he wrote a treatise called uh, Manuel sur les dangers de l'onanisme et conseils relatifs au traitement des maladies qui en résolvent. Sorry for my French. Anyway, um, what is important here is that De Brain was um, the bridge between this medical moral literature and uh, um, moral theology. And there are very important examples of um, uh, theologians uh, such as uh, Jean-Baptiste Bouvier, um, uh, the Archbishop of Reims, uh, Cardinal Thomas Cusue. They all relied first and foremost 
on the brain. And they too refer to Tissot, uh, Jacques-Louis de saint Dubreuil, and other medical authors. So this medical understanding of onanism influenced the development of 19th century moral theology. Um, I just want to give you another example. Um, Bouvier was a theologian, but he wrote too about um, uh, the symptoms of uh, onanist couples who presented, this, um, for example, uh, local irritation, spasm, spasms, mental depletion, loss of memory, consumption, and eventually death. It was a, a moral theologian. His main concern was um, how to deal with onanist couples. Uh, so masturbation um, wasn't really his main focus, but uh, what is important here to emphasize is that he received this um, medical moral literature and um, he appropriated it. Um, So to say it's in Foucauldian terms, um, we could say that this modern Catholic uh, um, focus on sexual morals arose within um, this medical discursive order. I'm very cautious when I quote Foucault, but sometimes, yeah, I, I think it's useful. Um, Okay, um, as one can expect, um, what happened in, in uh, Catholic moral literature uh, for confessors agrees with the idea of um, um, secularization um, where science is the engine of secularization and secularizes um, moral theology and religion as a consequence. Um, what is less obvious in my view is that um, these religious ideas that uh, were presented in these um, uh, Catholic moral literature uh, were received back, reincorporated in medical um, popular literature uh, at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. Um, for example, uh, there are some vulgarizing doctors um, who considered uh, religious values really important to um, sexual morality. And um, they, um, they thought that um, the, the, the law of nature was the law of God. And there was an equivalence between um, the law of nature and the law of God. So according to them, nature ruled the sexual realm and um, it, it established uh, laws, exceptions and purposes of sexuality. So for example, uh, Georges Surblé, uh, wrote that the purpose of genital organs is that of achieving their natural end, which is generation. Everything opposed to this end is illegal, meaning against the law set by nature and God. This is, uh, uh, was written in 1909 um, in Levis Conjugal. Um, but he wrote also that procreation is a respectable and sacred work. Um, so one could say that uh, Georges Surblé um, was a Catholic physician, and um, this is quite uh, understandable that he was defending his religious point of view. But what I found uh, interesting is that other 
doctors, for example, uh, Louis Francois Bergeret, who wasn't Catholic at all. Uh, he was a friend of um, um, sorry, a very, a very well known a French doctor. I don't remember. Sorry, um, a pasteur. He was a friend of but with, with Pasteur. Um, Bergeret had a similar view of uh, physiology. And he believed uh, that the loss of religious values was the culprit of um, um, abuses, aberrations, uh, and frauds. And when I say frauds, I mean contraception. So these doctors thought that um, contraception was uh, a sort of trick, um, um, like a cunning trick um, to, um, to trump um, the, the, the natural um, goal of, of generation. Um, it has, it, it, it's, necessary, it's necessary to say that um, these doctors thought that um, the general propensity uh, for onanism um, resulted from um, modern life, from uh, uh, the life in the cities, um, from uh, a certain lifestyle, from selfish uh, calculations, greedy people, uh, from material prosperity. So there was like a, a specific context that, that produced um, these um, uh, behaviors. Uh, what I wanted to, 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 to emphasize here is that these um, vulgarizing doctors, uh, as they are called, um, used uh, religious metaphors and uh, um, they maintained that religion uh, was um, a pillar, uh, like a, a, a safeguard for, for um, sexual morality. Okay. Um, I've skipped a bit, so if something is not clear, please let me know. Another example uh, I just want to um, brought to your attention is uh, the example of sexual purity. Because sexual purity is another area where um, medical and religious perspectives um, conflated. And uh, my idea is that uh, sexual purity uh, is not... Um, something similar to uh, the traditional idea of sexual renunciation that is present in, in, in Christian tradition since uh, the fathers of the church. Um, I don't think that modern sexual purity is in any way a revival of chastity. I'm gonna show you why. Um, I think that modern sexual purity is something typically modern and it's something that is still quite successful and mostly directed to women. As the random search engine, I've copied and pasted in these light shows, there are images of women and uh, there is um, a form of rhetoric that addresses them. Um, it's true that there are traditional themes uh, behind the idea of sexual purity. For example, um, there was uh, um, traditionally a link between virginity and purity. And uh, two thinkers such as Cyprian, um, a father of the church, uh, virginity served um, the purpose of um, preserving the body sanctified by um, baptismal water. And yes, uh, we can say that sexual purity refers to these lore and it would be wrong to say the contrary. 
Uh, but what I'm going to show you has very modern features. Um, to start with, um, sexual purity inspired a social movement. It was a social movement. And uh, it was uh, um, a response. This movement was a response uh, to the late 19th, early 20th century debates on sex education. Um, sexual purity became um, a topic of numerous publications uh, published around those decades between the end of the 19th century and the early uh, 20th century. These publications were mostly um, um, oriented to middle class youth. And uh, in these uh, books, manuals, um, education for purity wasn't just uh, something that had to do with the body. Uh, sexual purity was um, the training uh, into uh, a way of life. And uh, I have to say that sexual purity was um, a set of ideas that, um, again, doctors um, uh, praised as very healthy. So sexual purity was... Um, Again, a topic that um, was across the board. It was uh, um, it was popular among doctors and Catholics used scientific arguments to increase uh, the credibility of this discourse on sexual purity. So again, medicine and religion um, intertwined. Uh, So debates on sex education appear uh, within the context of the so-called sexual question, uh, sexual frage in German, la questione sessuale uh, in Italian, um, and I, I could go on uh, with other languages. It was a problem felt in, in, in most European countries. Um, Sexuality was a source of concern uh, in, medical, uh, in, in many countries, and it was a sign of uh, the more on physical health of population. Uh, in many countries, there were societies committed to uh, sanitary and uh, moral prevention. The two terms uh, were associated, um, sanitary and moral. Um, for example, uh, in France, la Société Française uh, de Prophylaxie Sanitaire et Morale was established with the idea of counteracting the diffusion of venereal diseases by any means, religious, medical, and political. So sex was a source of danger. Uh, this danger, um, was uh, found in uh, sexual promiscuity, in new sexual uh, practices, sexual behaviors. Um, this danger was uh, could be found in um, the very widespread sexual um, diseases. And um, it, uh, it's necessary to underline that uh, pr prostitution um, was uh, very common. It was uh, considered uh, inevitable um, accompaniment to marriages. And uh, because of the dif diffusion of venereal diseases, uh, there were many er hereditary um, diseases as uh, hereditary syphilis, for example, uh, which could um, um, cause um, blindness too. Um, so the idea of controlling sex uh, 
was an idea that was um, intertwined uh, with eugenic concerns. And uh, the Catholic response uh, to these debates on sex education, sex reforms, and, and eugenics um, was a response uh, that tried to keep up with these discourses. Um, so one of the proposals to counteract these um, problems uh, with sex was sex education. Um, many doctors uh, advocated sex ed education as a form of prophylaxis against the diffusion of these diseases, but there were many questions arising uh, from these proposals. For example, how could uh, youth be informed of the risks of sexuality? Could sexuality be taught? Uh, were anatomy and reproductive physiology suitable subjects to be taught? Uh, what was the right way to teach uh, about sexuality? So, um, one of the main um, authors, uh, Catholic authors um, on this topic on, on sex education was uh, Joseph Alphonse and Graves. Um, he published a very successful uh, manual um, entitled Advice to Parents and Teachers about Education for Purity. Um, sorry, I, I don't remember the, the French title. Um, uh, he was the son of a medical practitioner, um, himself the author of a series of popular medical writings. Um, according to Fonson Graves, um, Sexual purity was a long-standing teaching method aiming to create an enduring habits that would, uh, would ultimately lead to chastity. So chastity was a long-term goal in his, um, in his view. Uh, but von, von St. Graves uh, wasn't uh, against sex education at all. He believed that sanitary and moral prophylaxis ought to be taught together. Um, sex education couldn't be subject in schools. Um, this was um, his point of view. Um, it, has, it had to be taught individually, possibly within families, and framed within the right moral um, um, pedagogy, pedagogy. Since Fonson Krebs wasn't the only author uh, who wrote about sex education um, within Catholicism, but it, it, it was probably the most famous, but there were many Catholic authors who wrote about um, education for purity. So when I talk about education for purity, I'm talking about a Catholic way of teaching sex education. So these Catholic manuals for sex education had a very strong moral um, um, pedagogy, but uh, they had sex education too. So they had um, information about reproductive physiology, for example, about pu puberty, about um, sexuality, how um, sex worked. It, they were complete manuals. And um, as a result of these um, um, sensation, I would say, as a result of this success, uh, the Holy Office launched an investigation 
1925. And there is a very thick folder about uh, education for purity um, in the Oli Office archive. Um, so the investigation uh, was uh, carried out by um, an advisor uh, of the Oli Office uh, who was uh, very known for his anti-modernist views. Uh, his name uh, is Henri Lefloc. It was a French. Um, um, it, it was a French uh, author, and um, he had a very strong point of view on the topic. So he reviewed um, many of these manuals um, on behalf of the Ali office. And he wrote a report, as um, very often happened. So what he found was that most of these um, manuals recommended um, sex education. Uh, and uh, and uh, these Catholic authors um, considered um, sex education necessary because of the exceptional circumstances. So they wrote, for example, assuming that adolescents will dwell in absolute ignorance of sexuality seems absurd today. That was something that they wrote in um, the first decades of the 20th century uh, before internet. Um, and the majority of these authors believe that um, they shouldn't be afraid of merging scientific information and religious morality. Uh, for some of them, uh, the key word for introducing sex education was conjugal love, for example. Um, for others, um, like the Dominican uh, um, Eduardo Gillet, um, any unnecessary anticipation of would represent a danger. So the most conservative um, of these authors, uh, like Gillet and uh, Agostino Gemelli, for example, um, believe that um, sex education would have um, caused an unnecessary um, awakening to sexuality. So their proposal was to um, educate children and young people um, for uh, self-restraint, for decency, for um, um, a strong um, attitude towards uh, sensual um, um, sensual pleasures, se sensual desires. And uh, what happened was that Le Floc uh, was able to sway um, the assembly of the cardinals within the Holy Office. And uh, um, the idea that ignorance of sexuality provided more safety than science preva prevailed. And uh, as a result of this investigation, Pius XI issued uh, the encyclical um, um, Divini Ilius Magistri, uh, where he stated, uh, the naturalism is really dangerous. At present times, it invades the field of education in relation to a very delicate subject, morality. It's, it is very widespread, the error of those who promote such sex education with dangerous arrogance and, and with an ugly word. Uh, considering erroneously that they will protect youth against sensual dangers 
with merely natural means. Um, like this daring initiation and preventative instruction for all indiscriminately and publicly. Even worse is the idea of exposing young people to early opportunities, getting them accustomed to the argument almost to harden their spirit against those dangers. Finally, faults of morality are not the effects of intellectual ignorance, but of an unsteady will. So this was the results of this investigation. And uh, as I said, um, this decision uh, of the Holy Office was based on the idea that children ought to be educated to obey and to gain strict self-control. Um, young people ought not to be instructed on reproductive physiology. That was um, something very important. And I think uh, on the long periods uh, with um, long consequences. So um, there are a few uh, things to consider when we talk about sexual purity. And uh, we have to bear in mind that in, in that period of time, um, women um, started to contravene their sexual expect sec sorry, social expectations. Um, for their reproductive behaviors, for their claims on their rights, uh, for um, advocating uh, voluntary motherhood, uh, women were considered a cause of social and eugenic degeneration. And this has to be said, this wasn't just um, a Catholic interpretation of degeneration. This was across the board, um, um, a eugenic concern that women were um, creating um, a worse uh, society, that they didn't, um, they didn't make enough babies, that uh, um, they didn't uh, bring up their babies in the right way. And um, and what, what has to be said is that Catholic eugenics focused on fecundity and sexual purity. So sexual purity was something that was um, um, more Catholic within the, the eugenic movement. And uh, it's important to remember that Pius XI started to launch crusades for purity in 1926. And uh, the target of these uh, crusades were women. How these um, campaign work? Um, it worked through um, new um, female organizations. Um, more purity shaped the profile of new Catholic um, activism. And uh, I have to say that um, the control of morality wasn't like a, a marginal issue. The rhetorical um, propaganda of Catholic action, for example, uh, revolved around purity. Uh, this propaganda exhorted women to be pure and to fight to preserve Christian moral values in society. Um, this wasn't just like folkloric, a folkloric element um, within Catholicism. It was, um, 
it was very important. And uh, Pius XII uh, went to the point to blame women as accountable for war atrocities during World War II because of their sinful and indecent demeanor. So there was an implicit equivalence between overall morality and the control over the female body. So women were responsible for the education of their children and for bringing up um, um, children with um, pure ideas, ideas of purity. Women were responsible for having um, decent um, and, and, and pure demeanor. And in practical terms, that meant uh, not taking part in dancing, not following fashion, not um, um, going against um, like social um, conventions. Um, the idea was that sexual integrity could purify the world against materialism and the loss of Christian um, values. Um, I don't know, I, I, probably, I probably skipped a, a, a quite a lot. I don't know, um, but I just want to, to, to wrap up and, and then if we have time, I can get into details in, um, about other topics. So what I wanted to, uh, uh, to, to do today was to give you an idea of, um, of themes that in my view are crucial. So for example, the topic of onanism, uh, which is um, um, essential to all Catholic discourses in these periods, um, shows us that um, there is a long and complex genealogy that uh, Catholic discourses uh, merged and, and conversed uh, with medical popular literature. And uh, I wanted to show you that um, things like sexual purity um, that we, we, we take for granted and we think that um, date back to um, um, the age of the fathers of the church have um, a quite recent history or quite um, modern features. And uh, what I wanted to show you is that um, medical and religious uh, perspectives um, um, merged, intertwined and, and conversed. And uh, even though, of course, there was some uh, resistance at times, there were spaces for collaboration too. And um, even medical um, popular writings um, welcomed, um, accepted and appropriated uh, religious ideas. So, Thank you. I don't know how long I spoke, and and uh, I'm I'm happy to go into details now. Thank you so much for for this. I think we can clap our hands uh, with Zoom. Uh, that that was really fascinating. Uh, all those continuities and ruptures, and how some things we think that, especially in countries like Poland, we think they were like forever. They have been there always, they're not, it's, they're new. So before, so if there is anybody who has a question, you can either raise your hand uh, or you can just also ask a question in the chat. And now first I will just give it to Agata Ignacuk to um, wrap to, you know, uh, ask the first question. <laughs> 
Thanks so much, uh, Lucia, for the uh, talk and for the book, which is, I think, really important for us as a research team. We are looking at the uh, Catholic interventions, very broadly speaking, around reproduction in Poland from the 1930s and the decision to start to um, to take 1930 as a starting point of our project was very much based also on around or um, justified through your scholarship on Castico Nubi. So we owe you a lot in the Catholic team and, uh, and thanks for the book, which is very important in, um, in uh, so meticulously documenting this um, circulation um, of knowledge and exchange of knowledge and ideas between medicine and Catholicism as a long standing process. No, not, nothing new, nothing that's uh, there since maybe the birth of bioethics in the 60s. It's, 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 it has a very, very long and, um, and interesting history. And uh, yeah, and it's fascinating how you trace in the book and also you showed this today you know, in, the, in the talk um, with the example of, of onanism, you know, how these malleable terms <clears throat> uh, can be filled with different meanings according to um, underlying interests, which are sometimes made explicit and sometimes not, no? And I think the, um, there is like a bigger malleable term that's maybe informing onanism and also contraception debate a bit later on, which is nature itself, no? So what, yep. what does it mean to be natural and unnatural, no? And how this is defined? And in the um, uh, later debate around the, the possibility of including oral contraceptives as this um, as an accepted accepted method of regulating um, or, or pursuing a responsible parenthood, this nature debate emerges as well, and how how theologians and Catholic doctors argue that the pill is natural, no, or how yeah, sex. Yeah. And with onanism, you know how determined type of types of sexual behaviors are natural, whether whether others are not natural, and therefore there are pathological. No? So this is um, um, really important to be able to see um, more examples and longer history of these um, exchanges. No, and I have one question which is um, linked uh, to like maybe the workshop, no, the historical workshop, because you've worked in the Vatican archives. And this is something really fascinating, no? And could you, if you, if you're willing to know, to give us just a little bit of like the insider info, how 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 one works in the Vatican archive? Ah, uh, so um, yeah. Thank you very much uh, for your um, for your question and for your lovely uh, remarks. I'm 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 delighted that uh, there is someone <laughs> always uh, finding my work uh, useful. Um, so. My work in uh, Vatican archives um, lasted uh, a few years because uh, I wasn't able to trace um, the history of Castico and Nubi uh, so easily. Um, I started to dig into the Holy Office archive and, and uh, couldn't find anything. Um, I eventually um, traced uh, this history in uh, the archive of the Pontifical um, Pontifical uh, Gregorian um, University archive in their archive because uh, the author of the encyclical was the German theologian uh, who taught uh, at the Pontifical Gregorian University. So that was a uh, uh, um, lucky um, finding for me. And so I was able uh, to trace back the history of Castico Nobi. But um, when I started to look into um, the Holy Office uh, files, uh, I found a lot of interesting material. And, and I thought that there was uh, much more about sexuality than the discourse on, on, on birth control. And, 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 and that's why uh, I, I needed to, um, to understand better how uh, could this happen? Because I have to say, in the 30s, um, looking retrospectively, you would expect to find something about, um, or more about total, total, totalitarian regimes, um, violation of um, rights, and, and uh, but there was a, a huge concern uh, with sexuality. And I thought, 
how can these concern with sexuality overshadow even uh, concerns uh, with totalitarian regimes, including communism, which was a concern for the Catholic Church, and, and, uh, and uh, Nazism as well. Um, I think it, it's difficult to, to, to give um, a simple answer to this question. So I, I tried in my book, but I think that there are many possible answers. And, and I think that um, one way to explain these uh, concerns uh, with sexuality is um, with Foucault's ideas. Uh, yeah, again, I, I just want to be cautious when I, when, I, when I bring up Foucault because Foucault is often misused and, and uh, um, quoted, uh, quoted too much in my view, but, but his idea that sexuality emerged in the 19th century as a, like a, a coherent um, discursive order makes sense to me and is uh, confirmed in Catholic moral literature too. And I, I don't want to say that uh, manuals com for confessors uh, didn't engage with uh, contraception in the, let's say, 17th century. This is not true, but it wasn't such a huge concern. This is radically modern. This is what I mean when I say that these um, um, Catholic, um, I would say obsession with sexuality is something really modern. Um, I don't know if I have answered your question. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I have to say that I wanted to, to, to write much more in my book, but unfortunately I was unable to travel when um, I was finishing um, the last chapters. And so um, I had to cut it off a bit, but yeah. There is still a lot of material that can be used to um, to, to look into um, the history of sexuality within, especially the Holy Office. There is a lot, and I think that after um, um, the opening of the section of uh, Pius the Twelfth, there is much more. I'm stuck here in Australia, but <laughs> you can go ahead and have a look. <laughs> Well, but you can write another book, I guess. On this. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so do we have some more questions or comments from the audience? Anyone? Yeah, don't don't be shy, really. I'm I'm yeah, don't be shy. <laughs> I, I don't I don't bite, I swear. And uh um I, I just want to be approachable. I know that there are students here and I, I don't want to be intimidating at all. And, uh, there are students and there are also experts in the field from various uh, European contexts. So that would be really yeah. great to hear your thoughts. I don't know, Natalia, do you have any question? Well, but then let me, let me just, uh, let me just, you know, uh, just say a few words, uh, you know, in reference to what you said in the beginning, and it was so obvious within your talk how, I mean, how Foucauldian is this, and also how much uh, uh, there's this really strong continuity, because if you look at this from the, the contemporary Polish perspective, I mean, today's Polish perspective, then you can, then you can see that this idea of sex education is something uh, that it's not about you know educating about sex, but you know as something uh, that you know all this preparation for the family life should be about how to restrict your sexuality. And then we have this concept in Poland of sexual sexualization, you know, the sexualization of children. So sex educators are being accused of sexualizing children, you know, awakening about them about their sexuality. So this this and this is like so crucial for the like, current political conflict in Poland. So then it, it's uh, it, in a Catholic country, yes. Yeah? So so I think that it is really fascinating how to see how this concept is, is modern and how it developed historically and how stable is this just today um, and how, how much we just, uh, I think it can really 
help us understand uh, this kind of uh, arguing that uh, that is going on. So, so I think this is uh, really relevant for also for understand for you know for for the contemporary politics, not only for history. Yeah, uh, thank you for bringing it up. Um, yes, absolutely. And uh, you know, I come from Italy. Uh, you're in Poland, and and uh, we we both know how Catholic countries um, work, and uh, and sex education is uh, something that is not really um, relevant in our school curricula, for example, in Italy. It's uh, because of these historical reasons, and and uh, uh, still an issue that is debated. Yeah, I mean, nowadays, uh, I think that COVID has, has replaced many of these discussions, but um, um, sex education is still an issue, at least in Italy. And, and, uh, and the arguments um, that critics of sex education use are the same that were used 100 years ago, exactly the same. So it, it, in these, I think it's relevant to to, um, to show what what was what was the discussion within the Holy Office because there was some um, um, disagreement, I would say. Not everyone was was uh, um, fine with uh, um, this form of education for purity just as a uh, moral um, um, moral pedagogy the, the was the was uh, and had been an attempt to introduce um, um, a complete form of sex education with with religious um, um, information to where there was something about reproductive physiology and uh, moral education. Yeah, it's very really important, and I, I probably, I probably go too far if I say that um, there is something relevant to another order of discourses. Um, I think that since then. Um, the Catholic Church as an institution has missed um, the point of sexuality. And I mean that there is still that ignorance that we're referring to. So I think that when, when the Catholic Church as an institution tackles uh, the problem of sexual abuses, is still... Um, um, involved with that idea of ignorance. So not being able to, to, to see um, the problem of sexual abuses because, because there is a refusal of um, accepting sexuality and, and understanding sexuality. I don't know if that, if that makes sense. And it's, it's probably a bit far-fetched but it, it's something that struck me as um, as uh, very important with long consequences. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, and I think it's also the case uh, in Poland that this these issues are just not recognized as such. Yeah, they are discussed, but on a very not very deeply. I, I would say. Okay, so do we have some questions, comments? You can also ask uh, your questions uh, by, you know, typing them in the chat box. So anyone? Yes, of course. Uh, that's a fascinating, <laughs> fascinating <laughs> talk. Uh, yeah, yeah, but just, you know, to refer to your last, to your comment on, on COVID and, and sex education, Poland, for instance, in the second month of, the pandemic back in 2020 has this huge debate in the Polish parliament on sex education. So it's not necessarily that easy okay. that COVID covered this, <laughs> not at least not, not at least here. 
that because there was this huge sex education uh, discussion to there was a project to ban sex education at schools because it it does what you just said yeah sexualized children so okay so do we have any comments or questions anyone would like to i mean if no one else does then i will yeah but go ahead i don't, I, don't so. I was afraid to are kind of out of your expertise but uh what you everything that you said is actually you know somehow against the common knowledge about how we imagine that um this uh, sexual ob obsession of the church is mostly like Im related in the common imagination to the middle ages or like especially the myth of the middle ages and how like we actually say that something is so middle-aged because it's so like restrictive sexually. And I, I just kind of wonder if like, what the discourses, the church discourses of sexuality before, like how, um, how was it really different before this modern turn you were talking about? Like, what are you know, where you can really talk about this. Yeah, yes, I can. Uh, thank you very much. That, that That's a very good point. Yes, uh, usually, uh, yeah, it's something that we are prone to say, oh, that's very medieval, or oh, that's that's a Catholic church. The Catholic church has always been like that. Uh, not really. Um, uh, to start with, I, I just want to give you an example of um, uh, of how uh, abortion was uh, understood. So for example, if you look at uh, some 17th century uh, manual for confessor, and I'm referring here at, uh, to um, um, the Jesuit Sanchez, uh, for example, he wrote about abortion in a more, much more nuanced way. So abortion wasn't absolutely forbidden. It was something that could be provoked for the right reasons. And you have to consider that before the 19th century, uh, there was the idea of two uh, competing interests and, and uh, the idea that the mother was um, um, bearing more interest than the child was very common. The idea that the mother was responsible for a family and for other children um, was something that um, I would say most, theologian, uh, most theologians would have agreed upon. What happens uh, after the 19th century was that the life of the mother and the life of the fetus were um, put at the same level. And so it was possible to talk about competing um, uh, interests in, in, in a totally different way. Uh, I don't know if I have answered your question. Yeah. So abortion wasn't absolutely forbidden back then in the in this 17th century, probably even before, but it became absolutely forbidden after the 19th century, the end of the 19th century. This is, um, yeah. I'm referring in particular um, to um, the studies of, a, of an Italian colleague because I've, I've, um, I haven't written so much about abortion. I, I, I wrote something in, the, uh, in, in a chapter of my book, but um, I have a colleague in Italy who has done work in, uh, on abortion. Um, Thank you. This if... is super interesting. And I um, also think like there's something very modern about this idea of the equality of the two lives of a fetus and of a mother. Yeah. The name of uh, this colleague is Emmanuel Betta. Yeah, you probably know him. Yeah. 
so we have a question in um in the chat. Uh, let me. So, uh, Yana, do you wanna uh, do you want me to read it or? <laughs> so no, no, no. Go? I can read it. Um. So we're. Yeah, I was just think. I was just hoping that Yana, the the, okay. the colleague who answered who asked the question, <laughs> uh, okay. would like to say it. But I know. But yeah. yeah. Um. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, hi, thank you so much for, for this fascinating presentation. I was, I was just wondering whether you came across um, any instances where the, the medical discourse was in opposition, sort of, you know, to the, to the preferred religious standing of the theologians at the time when this was all developed. And in particular, I was thinking about this psychiatric movement whereby, you know, the, the female sexuality was being explored and some psychiatrists, they had this idea that lack of sexual satisfaction um, could be the cause of, for example, neurosis and, and things like yeah. that. And I, I'm very curious how the theologians, the, the, the Catholic you know, thinkers were dealing with these kind of um, alternative medical discourses. Um, look, I would, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm probably exaggerating, but I would lump these kind of uh, psychiatric ideas within um, the broad uh, field of sexology. And sexology was something that raised a lot of suspicion uh, within Catholicism. So, if it was possible to um, have compromises uh, with medicine, there was no possible compromise when these kind of ideas were discussed. Okay. And uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm thinking if I um, if I have any example um, on the top of my mind, but. Um, I think that even theologians referred to neurosis, but I think, as far as I remember, that their idea of the, the medical notion of neurosis caused by the lack of sexual satisfaction could find uh, a solution within marriage and conjugal sexuality mm -hmm. only if that makes sense. Yes, of course. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so it sounds oh. like, it sounds like uh, you know, forever enemies, the, the religion and the psychiatry and nowadays perhaps psychology a bit more, <laughs> but thank you. Yeah, oh, no, 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 no problem. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking there were overlaps, like um, some doctors agreed that, um, Sexual purity uh, could work in normal people, people without um, uh, without particular um, sexual uh, propensities. So for normal people, sexual purity worked. Uh, but yeah, that, it's like they kind of refer to these uh, medical literature and they acknowledged it, but they couldn't agree on everything. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for this. Any more questions? We are, I think, now running out of time. So if there is anyone with a really strong need to ask a question, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, if not, then just let me just thank Lucia for this really wonderful talk and thank that uh, a lot. Big thanks to the audience for the questions and comments. And uh, we, I hope we will see you soon for our next, um, for our other seminars. And the, the, um, the, the, the next one will be on February 24th and Jana Jakubowska, the histori historian of art from, from the University of Warsaw, will be talking about female sexuality and Catholicism in the feminist art uh, in 
socialist Poland. So it's a, a little bit different, but still really fascinating topic. And that will, be in, <laughs> that will be in English. Uh, so please join us for, for the next. So Lu Lucia, uh, Lucia, thanks so much for, for this. Thank you. And Thank you for this opportunity. And, and uh, if you have questions uh, that you don't want to ask me now, uh, you can email me and I'm happy to uh, help you and, and, uh, and answer if I can. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, it was uh, good to see you all. And thank you in particular, Agata and Agnieszka and Natalia. Thank you very much. Thank you.